Yeah, welcome to our session today. Uh, we are still waiting for you know, our colleagues to join. Uh, but for the sake of time, I think uh, it's important that uh, uh, we manage it properly. So without further uh, waiting, I think uh, uh, you can start. Uh, my name is uh, Godfrey Odinga uh, from Tanzania. I work with the Ministry of Health uh, as a laboratory supply chain advisor. And uh, in our session today, I will be a subject matter expert uh, uh, to pass you through slides uh, on rational use of medicines. And uh, I hope that you enjoy the sessions. Uh, without wasting time, let me share the slides. So some housekeeping announcements uh, to take note. Kindly mute your mic and turn off your video. Uh, ask questions using the chat box and raise your hand. You can see the icon on your bottom of the screen. Uh, you may ask questions in the chat box at any time. But when and only you are invited to speak, please remember to unmute and turn on your video. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, the webinar recordings will be available in Empower School channels. Also, the slide desk will be shared with all participants. Uh, the objective of the meeting is to give you a chance to ask questions and to be answered by an expert. Uh, we'll just summarize the module, then invite questions. Uh, the introduction part will take uh, five minutes, just skipping, and then we'll have a presentation on the rational use of medicines. What is it? What has it got to do with PSM, which is very important for all the participants here to understand. And then we'll have the first question and answer questions. We'll have another presentation on how the PSM can make pressure of medicine use and pharmacovigilance work, which will take around 20 minutes. And then we have another second question and answer session that will take around 15 minutes. So we expect that uh, this session will take uh, approximately one hour. Okay, straight to the right. What is rational use of medicine? Okay, I have to admit some people. Rational use of medicine requires that patients receive medications appropriate for their clinical needs in doses that meet their own individual requirements for an adequate period of time at the lowest cost for them and the community. So it's very important for us to understand that whenever we talk about rational use of medicines, there are around three or four issues that we need to take into consideration. One is the clinical needs of the patients. We also need to ensure that the doses meet their individual requirements, clinical individual requirements and also the time factor for what period of time and the cost, which is essentially everything that we talk about nowadays is about cost. So at the lowest possible cost for them and their community. And we have a link there. Uh, rational use of medicine is a major global problem. Rational use of medicine 
uh, is a major problem and WHO estimate more than half, more than, more than half of all medicines are prescribed and dispensed or sold inappropriately. So you can understand the magnitude of the problem. And also half of all the patients take, fail to take this, uh, to take them correctly. So this results into overuse, underuse, misuse, and result into wastage of the scarce resources and widespread health hazards. So here we see that the, the challenges are multifold. We are talking about wastage, and you know that most uh, developing countries, uh, which majority of us here probably come from, we know that we have scarce resources and also uh, the burden of the diseases uh, and those uh, at some point is attributed to widespread uh, misuse, attributed to uh, wrong prescription, uh, inappropriate use and all that stuff. So it's very important to understand that uh, this is a major global problem. So there are some issues that surround rational use of medicines. And uh, for us to get the facts right, we need to understand that we need to get the right dose. Uh, we also need to consider the right frequency of administration, right route of administration. When you, you not properly dispense, then that medicine is likely not to have the desired effect to the client, to the patient that we are trying to manage. Uh, right follow-up, right indication, right dosage form, right duration of treatment. All this is important towards ensuring that we get the rational use of medicine and also the right information to the, the patient. So this is very important. Uh, how, what do you, do you, how do we define the, the, the rational use, use of medicine? Uh, it, by the WHO standards, which we prescribe to, uh, the definition of uh, rational use of medicine is prescribing right drugs in adequate dose for sufficient duration and appropriate to clinical needs of the patient. And then the cost factor at lower cost, okay? So why is this important? Why it is important? The most important factor and most prominent, most featuring is the money. Medicines are expensive. So we need to be sure that the medicines that we procure actually are used to the correct benefit of the patients that we procure them for. So go, looking at the table, you can see clearly uh, the typical situation and with the basic improvements to how we do business, the net effect that we can see from the effort that we can apply in our PSM operations so as to obtain the therapeutic benefit that we envision while administering, administering drugs to clients. So uh, the, the row above showing the typical situation and the row below after some improvements. So we see that 30% uh, 30% uh, in the typical situation is the therapeutic benefit that we, we get with the, with the medicines that are available. And uh, um, we look at the 21% being lack of adherence by patients, and the 13% being irrational prescribing, and the 6% being uh, the expiration. I'm a little bit colorblind, but I, I think I'm on the right track. Uh, the improper storage uh, accounting for 6%, and 9% being theft, 7% uh, 
accounting for poor quality and 9% the prices. So with basic improvements, which doesn't require very much cost input, we can achieve the therapeutic benefits of medicines that we receive by 70%, by just improving so little areas within our PSM operations, we can achieve 70% benefits. So next slide, uh, what does this mean? Lack of adherence by patients account for 20, 21%. And irrational prescribing accounts for 11%. These are critically two areas which can make more than 30% of wastage of medicine, medicinal value. So uh, by improving, in a layman language, by improving patients adherence and irrational prescribing, then we overcome 30% of wastage of medicine value. More than expiry, poor storage, theft, quality issues, all other factors, all other factors notwithstanding, if only improve on two areas, lack of adherence and duration of prescribing, then you overcome by 30%. The WHO is made that the appropriate use of medicine can result in about 50 to 70 percent cost efficiency. So WHO has even gone further to give us the estimate, estimate of uh, uh, the cost efficiency that we can achieve by improving on those two areas. Uh, so rational medicine has a larger cost impact than everything we do in procurement supply chain management. Very important to note because when we procure uh, commodities, medicines, and then they're not rationally used, there is wastage, there is irrational prescribing, uh, there is poor storage, there's theft, the quality issues, then that one uh, accounts for much wastage. And we have, as PSM experts, we have the, the role of advocacy, and overseeing that uh, we have a very important role to play in ensuring that uh, uh, the rational use of medicine is maintained and practiced. We, we, we shall see further in the, the next steps. Okay, so the rational use of medicines, the rational use of antimicrobial is highly prevalent and it's a major driving factor for antimicrobial resistance. So you see, other than the cost issues, there are also antimicrobial resistance for irrational use, attributed to irrational use. The impact of irrational use can vary widely. So there are also other risks like the adverse drug reactions, which increase due to irrational use, especially for old patients, which have medical conditions, comorbid individuals who have compromised psychological functions. Psychological, okay, psychological functions. Okay, the, the cost implications of adverse drug reactions can be enormous. So the, the cost is enormous. For instance, uh, this is, uh, uh, the study from US, actually they did an assessment on the cost of ad advanced drug reactions, which cost more than 430 million annually. And these are uh, pounds, I mean, these are euros. The cost of major admission subsequent to advanced drug reaction has been estimated to be at around 2 billion per year. That's a whole, lot of money. So if you quantify the cost of advanced drug reactions uh, to even countries that we sometimes see as developed and have the resources, 
the cost is enormous. So we, we as PSM has a very big role, as we can see, and we shall see in the upcoming slides. So according to the Nobel literate Joshua, the future of humanities and microbes evolves as episodes. Okay, so what Lederberg points out is that bad human practice, such as inappropriate use of antibiotics, is one of the key factors underlying the global insurgence of antimicrobial resistance. So we see the impact of how uh, antimicrobial resistance has impacted economically, uh, but also in terms of uh, uh, the public health concern, which is uh, uh, to save lives. So we see the impact of uh, uh, not adhering to rational use of medicine, how impact it impacts it to health, it impacts in the economy of uh, poor and also developing countries. So for the quantification part, uh, we have all of this we call circular impacts. Uh, so stock out sometimes drive to irrational use. You see, when you have stock outs, normally we tend to use what's available to save the patients. So uh, sometimes what is available is not what is, is uh, uh, what is according to the standards, what is according to the uh, list of essential medicines that uh, we we use in our country. So during stock out, we cannot be in a position to choose. We use what is available. So sometimes even stock out drive irrational use. Okay. So we also have the waste, wastefulness of all rational use can be perpetuated by simply continuing to order products based on information from historical use. You know, we all have logistics management information tools and we capture information on consumptions of these products that we dispense to patients. And when you experience stock out and you switch to another medicine, then what it means that uh, you will only have uh, consumption information for the medicine that you dispensed. So uh, it perpetuates, okay? It perpetuates stock out because you will only have information of the stock out or of the stock that you dispense the client. And uh, during the quantification, it, it can also mislead you because uh, you will be perpetuating the same uh, irrational use by ordering more of the commodities that you gave to the clients instead of the ones that actually are required according to the essential medical list. Okay, so that's the point that I wanted to make. Um, there are crucial factors that we need to consider in analysis, uh, especially around the rational use of medicines, the system. Uh, one of them being adjusted consumption method it has advantages and disadvantages. So the disadvantage, the tender please, can you mute your mic so that this mute the tender. Tender, the tender please, can you ask you to mute your mic so that you can be in a position to listen to each other. Thank you very much. So we are talking about how some of uh, factors that can lead to irrational use, uh, being adjusted consumption method, they are tasks that advantages and some disadvantage. The advantage being it's less complicated and easy to calculate, okay? Okay. And then we have another advantage being can be very accurate when based on accurate statistics and conformity to the treatment guidelines, okay? When you have to use the adjusted consumption method, then you have to have very accurate statistics, accurate records, accurate uh, uh, conformity to the treatment guidelines, okay? But the disadvantage is that it's difficult to adjust the changes in demand and use, okay? And it may also perpetuate irrational use of medicine, okay? 
So when demand changes because you are using uh, adjusted consumption, it's difficult to understand, okay? But it's also difficult uh, because it can also perpetuate irrational use of medicines and laboratory tests, okay? So we also have their table symptoms of uh, poor qualification uh, being uh, when you are faced with inadequate or inappro inappropriate drug supplies, like we said, uh, sometimes uh, prescribers, uh, the doctors, the clinicians, they are, they are faced with the uh, challenges of availability of commodities. So they prescribe what is available and not what is desirable to the client. And that can impact also negatively and uh, uh, also perpetuate the inappropriate dispensing in a, and, uh, and, uh, and contribute to the irrational use of medicine. In extreme cases, the, 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 the treatments are shortened to the point of ineffectiveness. Sometimes you face stock out. You don't have commodities and you have to continue with what's available and it's sometimes not even enough. So the treatment are shortened to the point that the, 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 the client doesn't, the, the, the client, the patient doesn't reap that, uh, that, 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 that uh, what we call uh, the therapeutic value of the medicine. So that's very important also to note. Okay, so these are secular impacts, secular the fact that they relate. Sometimes stockout drives rational use, and sometimes also rational use can also drive to stockout. So the circular is somehow interrelated, you know, goes back and back and forth. So uh, that's the point. You have to understand that uh, uh, stockout can drive rational use, and also irrational use can also drive to stockout. So uh, surely all this is uh, academic pharmacy, okay? So we have to ask ourselves, what does what does this got to do with PSM? Huh? This is purely academic, nothing to do with PSM. We can't tell doctors how to prescribe. Oh, okay, right. It's okay to say that. We cannot. We cannot say that. Okay? But when we ask why there's irrational use and lack of patients at the RS, and then we discover that PSM has a major role to play. It can create problems, okay? Sometimes we say, we say, we, we say that, no, it's not our role to, dis, to prescribe, or it's the pharmacist who dispense. We, can, we are not with the patient. We cannot, tell, we cannot force them to take pills. We cannot, yes, we cannot, but what? Sometimes we discover that PSM has a major role to play. We'll see in the next slides how PSM role in irrational use can contribute to this challenge. Okay, so antimicrobial resistance and supply, ch supply chain. This is a neglected relationship, you know? Antimicrobial resistance and supply chain are related, okay? But majority of us, we fail to recognize that. So uh, this slide seeks to bring us back into focus to understand that there's actually a linkage between antimicrobial resistance and supply chain. The supply chain component, especially in African region, uh, there are two significant some advanced medical, medical reaction related supply chain challenges according to WHO. Stockout, like I said, stockout of essential medicines and, and, and antibiotics can lead to increased circulation of counterfeit or substandard antibiotics. And this is basic, this is common sense, you know? When there is a gap, when there's stockout of uh, essential commodities, Normally, those manufacturing and the black market, they take advantage and come up with very substandard and counterfeit commodities to fill the gap and to make a quick kill. So this goes without saying that stockout can also drive uh, uh, 
it increased circulation of counterfeit and subsidized antibiotics. And the second and the most urgent challenge is lack of laboratory reagents. And this is a very, very big problem. This is a very, very big problem. In, 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 in sub-Saharan Africa, in middle and uh, developing countries. Uh, we have the Maputo Declaration, which uh, also requires that facilities or countries adapt uh, standardized methodologies, methodologies for uh, equipment to, to ensure that we have uh, commodities that are readily available uh, and makes the complexity in the supply chain, the, the, the economies of scale. We can address all those challenges by having standardized list of equipment. Uh, and we know that stock out of reagents is a very big challenge. So it also perpetuates the, the, the antimicrobial anti resistance. And this is a pure supply chain issue because when you don't have reagents, facility cannot test, there's wrong diagnosis. People get medicines that cannot treat and they keep fumbling from one medicine to another, and that one also contributes to We need to address the gap is so twice and where it is taken. Founded by like the uh, API. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Godfrey, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we can we cannot underestimate the impact of COVID, which has highlighted the fragility of our global medical supply chain and had a huge impact on the local operations. Okay. So what it means is that PSM, we have a very critical role to play to ensure that we mitigate uh, and contribute to rational use of medicine. We have also a case on TB. This is a case for the Philippines. Uh, as many as 2,663 patients may have been unable to obtain medicine from public health for a month or more. You know what that means? For one month, no TB medicine. Very, very critical. The likely impact of this stock out. Now look at the impact. Out of the 266 patients who would have developed multidrug resistant tuberculosis. And out of these 266 patients, they must have, they are likely to have infected an additional 63 people with MDR TB. Multidrug resistant TB is highly infectious and expensive to treat. So you can see the impact of stock out, okay? In addition, 588 patients and persons infected by those patients are likely to have died. So we have another loss of death, loss of life, okay? So it's very also important to take that into consideration. And then economic cost resulting from the stock out is likely to have been as much as USD, 21 million, that's a lot of money compared to 1.5 million for additional service delivery costs. Okay, that's service delivery cost. You know, when you calculate costs, you need to take all the consideration. You just don't look at a patient as an individual, look at all the operations. 
surrounding the service to that patient to bring the patient back to normal life. So there's also another additional cost of 1.5 million for additional service delivery costs and 19.5 million for additional household costs. People in Africa, we depend on each other. You have a family to raise, you have people who depend on you. So all that cost you also have to be factored in. And that's out of pocket costs and productivity losses. Okay, so these costs are pro approximately goes to around USD 8,000 per patient for only one month. Okay, what does this mean? The message here is that investing up to that amount to prevent stock out for one patient would have resulted in a net saving to a society. So, working towards eliminating stock out can have a net effect on saving to a society. That's the key point. We need to also understand that. Okay, so the table on the right side also indicate those, some of those key points. Uh, and we have already emphasized this. We need to also reiterate so that we understand better stock out, drive, antimicrobial resistance. Antimicrobial resistance leads to treatment failures. Treatment failures lead to spread of exposure. You see the cycle? It's always one word. You repeat it to the next, okay? The effect of the, of, of, of the point. Treatment failure leads to spread of infections. Increased infections lead to more adverse form of the disease. Increased morbidity and mortality is the net effect. And then we have to reduce stock out. Uh, Godfrey, yeah. sorry to interrupt me, you. Sir, we cannot see your presentation. Uh, could, you, could you please share your PPT? We cannot see your screen. We can only see you. Oh. Yeah, please share your screen. And please share that slide on which you are speaking so everybody can see it. Check now if you can share this screen. Please confirm. Share screen. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, I can see it well. Uh, can anybody please confirm if uh, if you can see the screen? Yes, you can see it now. Yeah, okay, great. Go ahead. Okay, so we are getting the key points around stock out and the effect, and we had a case in point for Philippines and how it impacted. And the overall message here is that uh, uh, by preventing the stock out, we have, we can actually result in net saving to our society. And looking at cost wise, we look at the cost of many the patient, cost of the care provided, cost of, uh, uh, cost of dependence, all that cost factor must be accounted for in calculating the impact of stock out. To a, to a patient. So another case, uh, this is, sorry, just a minute. Okay, we have another impact of drugs stock out on death and retention to care among HIV infected patients on combination antiretroviral therapy in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. So this is another case where we had stock out that affected at least 11% of the population on treatment. So the treatment discontinuation due to stock out were frequent and doubled the risk of interruption in health care or death. So there is a doubled risk and also uh, death. Using such data, uh, the increased hazard ratio for patient suffering 
interruption of treatment due to stock out was calculated at 2.83. So using the other hazard factor, the extra number of deaths would, would have potentially been averted if stock out did not occur was calculated at 254. So you can here again is another case where you can see the impact of stock out on provision of multi-drug uh, to HIV infected patients. Okay, the combination antiretroviral, antiretroviral therapy in Ivory Coast. So uh, after the calculation, it was noted that it was as much as 254. 503, which is around 4% of the total number of patients on ART. That's a very huge percentage. Okay, so that is the impact Stockout can contribute. Uh, and the key points are early warning indicators of HIV DR. We also have to ensure that Stockout, okay, we, we put measures in place to avoid Stockout to avoid or to prevent HIV drug resistance. And this is a purely supply chain management aspect, okay? It is our role as PSM to ensure that commodities arrive on time in sufficient quantities, correct condition, correct package, good cost, okay? And we maintain that integrity of the commodities up to when it goes to the client. Okay, so strengthening uh, the drug forecasting procurement and supply chain information and distribution system is key and essential towards ensuring that we avert the challenges of HIV drug resistance. Global and regional planning prior to and during change of preferred ARV regimens. So we need also to plan. Sometimes transitions come, and sometimes they come very fast. You are told today this, uh, according to the WHO publication, this drug is not good enough to manage clients at this level. We need to switch to another drug. So if you don't manage well the transition, then the impact of it can also lead to stock out and massive expiry, and all that is cost, cost in terms of the commodities wasted cost in terms of loss of life. So we also need to have a very careful balancing to ensure that everything goes smoothly and PSM has a very big major role to play. Okay. So, uh, I'm having challenges with the, the way the presentation appears, so I'm struggling a little bit. Um, sorry, just a minute. Oh, thanks. So now this is a slide on consequences consequences of antibiotic shortages. Uh, we have already talked about this. Just to emphasize, patients are prescribed suboptimal antibiotics. You prescribe what you have. In face of stock out, you prescribe what you have, and that's the tendency of most doctors and prescribers. There's, they cannot leave the patient to come to the hospital with a condition and they need management, and there's no medicine. What they do, they give the patient what is available. Huh? Sometimes they prescribe a broader spectrum antibiotics. Sometimes patients are prescribed an antibiotic on, high, on higher tires in their wear classification. We get to know what their wear classification is, but they are, the, the, the point is they're given medicine that are not appropriate for, that, for the management. Higher, higher dosage, higher level medicine. Substandard and falsified antibiotics get the market opportunity in face of stockout. That goes without saying. In, in ensuring that commodities are available and people take advantage of the stockout, then there is a room that is created for falsified okay, and substandard commodities to enter the market. So those are consequences of antibiotic shortages. So the WHO aware classification of antibiotics 
in, you, in the right box slide uh, shows the three tire classification of antibiotics, and that was done in 2017. And they are apart. The A stands for access, uh, and these are drugs that are active against uh, a range of commodity, uh, common pathogens, and have a, have a lower risk for resistant development, you see? So the A stands for the access, uh, drugs which are a range of common pathogens and a lower risk of resistance development. And it contain, contains 48 antibiotics, 19 of which are in the essential medical list. And the watch, these are drugs that have a higher risk for resistance development. And most of these drugs are critically important. Okay. So the use of 110 antibiotics, 11 of which are essentialist, should be subject to antibiotic stewardship program and used with care. So used with care is a keyword. That's why it's classified as watch and also essential because they have higher risk for resistance. It's very important that we accept that. And then there is a, this is not available for all category. No? These are last resort options which should be accessible and the use should be confined to specific patients where the options are not suitable, okay? So there are last resort options. That's the most important point to note. So due to stock out, sometimes we resort to not adhere to this WHO aware classification of antibiotics. We move along in each area, wherever the, the medicine is, whenever the drug is, we use it because that is the only available option that is available. So we have limited options. Okay. So we also have reasons for irrational use, which are PSM issues. And uh, here, for the sake of time, I'll just focus on the PSM issues. Okay. Patients have the right to get the correct drug information. They have the right to have a clear understanding, a clear explanations on the beliefs that they have around some drugs. There are some patients who cannot take tablets. They just need the injections. They believe that with the injections is when they, they can recover from the illness. So they need information. They need this misbelief dispelled, okay? So, they also have expectations, you know? You go to the hospital, they feel ill, no proper counseling, they feel that they're not being treated well. So they have also their expectation and demands, okay? A suitable presentation. The tablets are so huge, they cannot swallow. They find it difficult, okay? They're not packaged well, some very bad smell. They are manufactured in that manner, not that they are, they are deteriorating quality, no, just the way they are. They have some smell when you, for instance, for those who are used to, possibly some people don't like the smell of amoxicillin tablets. When you take the medicine and afterwards, you feel like the medicine, you go to the toilet and you feel the, the, the urine smelling, okay? All that stuff. So all that needs to be, take into consideration. So uh, the PSM issue in this is sometimes when it's not the nature of the medicine, okay? It can be contributed by substandard product, especially when there's bad smell. Extraordinary smell, we know amoxicillin, how it smells. But sometimes you, you, you take a medicine which you're used to and it doesn't smell and all of a sudden you feel a very bad smell. So that's a PSM issue. That's a PSM issue and we need to take note. We also have the pure package, okay? WHA does not recommend nowadays those tablets uh, in, 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 in bottles. They encourage blisters. So also need to take note of those issues when they're not poorly packaged. In polythene papers, 
in high temperature areas. Those are issues that are purely PSM. And then we cut the prescribers. You have prescribers who don't have enough education and training, okay? They prescribe everything that they see and they don't get to understand how the medicine work and they just prescribe. Those are issues that can also contribute to rational use. Inappropriate role models, lack of objective drug information, not enough information is in the drug, okay? So it gives opportunity for guesswork and that can also lead to irrational use. Limited experience, okay? People not adequate in experience on use, so can also contribute, okay? Misleading beliefs about drug efficacy, very important, okay? So what's the role of PSM? We need to get courses in medical colleges so that people understand all these issues. They need to know what is available in stock so that they don't prescribe any howling. What they see closer to them is what they describe. No, they prescribe what is there according to the essential medical list, okay? And according to the guidelines that we put in place. And the issues around workplace, heavy patient workload, issues around HR, people, clients are many, only two staffs, one staff, you have to move around all the sections of the hospital, the clinic, one person. So heavy work, patient load can also contribute to rational use. Pressure to prescribe, lack of adequate laboratory capacity, we have already talked about that. Insufficient staffing, we have already talked about that. And then what are PSM issues? Out of stock of diagnostics, we have already talked about that, very important. Drug supply system, are reliable supplies, the suppliers keep defaulting and pushing forward shipments, they don't arrive on time, contribute to shortages. Sometimes they lump shipments together, they come at once, they result to expired, expiry. So all these factors, those are functions, which are PSM. So what are our issues? We need to ensure that there is no out of stock. Okay, we provide notification in stock commodities so that facilities Okay. We also need to take, we also need to be sure that meets non essential drugs. They tend to prescribe what's available, inform prescribers, lab of regulation enforcement, no pharmacovigilance. Okay. So there's no regulations. So what does this mean? You can purchase, people purchase buying out of essential medical list. Because of lack of enforcement, you just purchase anywhere. So this is very key also to understand. And the final being promotion activities, okay? Misleading claims, especially around commodities that are branded. They always tend to advertise, to give falsified information on the ability of the medicine to, to treat misleading claims, this can also uh, impact in the rational use. So lack of regulatory control, okay? So as PSM, we need to focus on these PSM issues to ensure that we put up measures in place uh, to reduce, to minimize, to stop completely uh, the effect of the lapse in these areas that can contribute uh, to PSM issues, uh, that contributes to irrational use. So uh, this slide shows uh, uh, some of uh, pictures around uh, 
uh, the packaging uh, and the presentation of the commodities, the medicines, and which you can use uh, instantly to, to show uh, issues around quality in terms of the commodities that are available. So you need to uh, look for dentistry, mashti, medicine, okay, double cup, loose, okay, the medicine is bent, different color, uh, all discolored, there's dirt, foreign particles, crap, spit, all that. We need to also be in a position to inspect all these medicines at the storage warehouse. And when it's also reported, see the quality issues before they lead to challenges on the efficacy of the medicine. So those are very important factors to consider. Some twine, some sticking together, the orange peel, like you can see, for those who have a very good eyesight, you can see from the slide, the picture of that orange peel, okay? Some are, okay, sorry, some are laminated. How is the medicine going to be absorbed when they is laminated, see? Those are issues which are supply chain and PSM issues we need to take into consideration. So, next slide. Uh, sometimes report of bad smell are PSM issues because they might be storage related, okay? And there are examples of drugs. Just for your information, I'm not a pharmacist. So some of these medicines pronouncing them might be a challenge, but from a PSM perspective, we have a role to identify and be able to understand when things are not according uh, to the quality standards that were put in place. So when you have food smells, uh, the, when food smells, uh, when food smells bad, we know not to eat it. Just like medicine, okay? We need to apply the same medicine. It may be spoiled. What should we do if an antidepressant like bupropin smells bad? Okay, it indicates that the drug is deteriorating. So these are very key concepts that we need also need to take care of and ensure that we are familiar and we understand, okay? Uh, PSMRS, 54 million packages of 25 different over-the-counter remedies are now being recalled, you see? So by merely not ensuring that we play our PSM roles, okay, has led to recalling of 54 million packages of 27 different over-the-counter medicines. So you can see the impact, okay? The order comes from chemical, okay? This is a deep analysis of the way that chemical reactant in that medicine and how it, it contributes this bad smell. So you can still read through. Uh, another factor, I think this is important for us to understand, the use of wooden pallets, okay? There are standards that we are required to ascribe to when using wooded pallets, okay? First, when they are treated with fungicides, sometimes they penetrate the packaging and destroy the medicines and the drugs that we have in our stores. So there is a guideline on how to, to use wooden pallets. we we'll see that in the next slide, okay? But the general recommendation is to use pl plastic pallets, okay? When safety and hygiene for the commodities that we are handling, the medicines and the drugs that we are handling, it's very key that we use plastic pellets, okay? So uh, in the past, you see, pharmaceutical manufacturers have never included pellets as part of the quality control programs, okay? As a result, poor quality pellets, okay? So they have quality standards for pellets. So we have issues around pellets. 
pharmaceutical manufacturing such as Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer have issued product recourse due to product contamination from wooden pipes. See the impact? Very huge. Uh, major manufacturing are calling products due to poor storage using wooden pipes that have been uh, that have been treated by antifungal uh, uh, antifungal products that penetrate the medicine. Okay, so below the standards, international standards and measures that should be put in place before using wood as a pallet. Okay, one one of them being six millimeter uh, thickness should at least be exposed to 56 degrees centigrade of heating for at least 30 minutes, okay? And whenever procuring these pallets, we'll notice that the initials, okay, HT are embedded in the pallet. So this can be a quality control, control uh, measure to ensure that you have the correct pallet whenever you, you decide to use uh, uh, the wooden pallet. So, irrational use of medicines. Uh, these are the key messages we need to take into consideration. Irrational use of medicines has many causes, okay? There are causes beyond PSM, but PSM must recognize that it's a major contribution factor to irrational use. And like we talked about the cycle, irrational use has a major impact on PSM. Okay, we have already elaborated that. One, another important factor and key message to take home is that PSM, as PSM, we must be involved and we have to work together to address the issues. Okay. The effective PSM contribution is to have reliable supply of quality assured medicines. There's no point in procuring if they're substandard because it won't uh, achieve the overarching target of reducing obesity and mortality. So we have a very huge role to play in ensuring that we procure reliable quality assured medicine. Stockouts, it's not just medicines. There's another message, very important message to note. When you're talking about stockouts, you're not talking about, you are not talking about medicines. For instance, we need, assuming that we are using uh, consumption metal for our quantification, and we have no records of the commodities that have been dispensed to the patients. So, when you are constantly stocked out of prescription booklets, then it can impact also, okay, to rational, in rational use of, it can contribute to rational use of medicine because you won't have records of what you dispensed, okay? Normally the prescription record has got three copies, one copy stay with the pharmacy, other with the client, and another at the dispensing, okay? So, uh, the prescriber remains with the copy, the pharmacy, and the patient. So it's very important to ensure that even these tools that capture uh, information on prescribing on medicines that have been uh, given to the patients are well maintained and adequate quantities at all the times. Okay. So. Let's get to ph pharmacovigilance. What is pharmacovigilance? Okay, WHO defines pharmacovigilance as the science and activities related to detection, assessments, and understanding and prevention of adverse effects of, a of any other medicine related problem. So it's around detection, assessment, understanding, and prevention. So those are very key concepts to understand whenever we are talking, we are thinking about pharmacovigilance. Okay, so uh, these terms are normally defined differently in different settings by different organizations, okay? So looking below the, the slide, uh, 
the, these are terms used by WHO, which we are going to see in the next slides. So we have ad, ad, advanced drug reactions. Advanced drug reactions have response. Adverse drug durations with adverse drug events. Okay, so we are talking about adverse drug reaction. The dose has to be correct. You've done everything correct. The dose correct frequency root, but still you find some reactions. Okay, so where do you classify the examples? Examples being allergic reactions, effect from withdrawal. Okay, when patient withdraw from medication, doesn't complete the dose, okay? All reactions caused by interaction with other medicines, you know, taking medicines that are interacting with each other. Those are examples of advanced drug reactions, okay? Also, we have the advanced drug events. These are harmful effect response caused by drug and inappropriate use of drug. Okay, this will be explained in detail in further in, in the next slides. So um, now our role at PSM. This is the most important and critical part. Because one of the key treatment failures are adverse drug reactions from medicines caused by substandard medicines you see we are getting back to substandard medicines once again we have a role as psm to ensure that we don't procure substandard we have measures in place to identify to source to procure the correct medicines on average 10 to 20 percent of medicines fail laboratory tests we just buy okay we don't secure the sources and that impacts on the quality of medicines. And this is a purely PSM issue. You need to understand that. For the sake of time, I'll be rushing through the slides. Okay, why are, they, why are there substandard medicines? Poor selection, specification, okay? We know the guidance on specification is not a purely PSM issues. We need to collaborate with the users, with the regulatory authorities, with all the stakeholders to ensure that we get the correct specification. We have the poor procurement procedures, okay? We just rush through things. We don't buy through secure sources, no quality assurance procedures, okay? And when we buy, even if they're quality assured, we don't monitor the storage conditions. We keep drugs which are, have issues on a bioavailability, in poor conditions. These are PSM issues, okay? The key question is pharmacovigilance. Are the medicines harming the patients? We should be asking ourselves that. If the medicine are harming the patient, then our objective are not met as PSM. We, many years of experience shows that the, when we check the, to identify the products, we identify pro programs arising from the PSM issues, okay? So it's very important to understand that. When will you know? When will you know that substandard medicines are causing problems? Standard, properly undertaking, PSM procedures and systems, especially QA, QA operations, should ensure that Substandard medicines never reach the patients. We have to ensure that our QA operations are structured in a way that we can detect, we can filter, we can ensure that substandard medicines never reach the patients. But the hard reality is that our PSM operations are weak. That's where our role comes in. We need to advocate. We need to put up measures in place. We are also underfunded. Nobody talks about PSM issues. When planning, they talk about program, no, no program, no commodities, no program. We have to integrate to ensure that PSM is fully funded, is fully integrated 
in any effort that goes towards public health betterment. Okay? And when you have them, some are poorly implemented. Okay? We don't have systems to monitor, to ensure that uh, we achieve the objectives that we put forward. We also need to go into that to detail and see that uh, we monitor that closely. Oh. Even basic things like good storage systems that comply with good storage practice all throughout the supply chains. These are basic things and they're lacking. When storage conditions are not good, medicine definitely deteriorate. That goes without saying. Okay. Okay. PSM involved in adverse drug reactions. It is important for medicines as it is for vaccines. Okay. Let's not be misled and we think that maybe only vaccines need that level of vigilance, level of attention, all medicines. All medicines also need the kind level of attention. Okay. We need to also to see from PSM perspective, okay, the errors and efficiency in transport and storage, major contributing factor to rational, to, 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 to rational use of medicine, to deterioration of the quality of medicines that we procure. So we also need to take that consideration. Okay. Not only PSM is the reason for a drug ad, ad, advanced drug reaction, but PSM can sometimes be the reason. So it's also very important to note, we have a very critical role to ensure that the contributing factors to drug relations are not PSM related, okay? Uh, PSM, we have to be aware. We have two roles, to be aware first and to be involved in pharmacovigilance for, for activities throughout, okay? PSM, you also have to understand, okay, the reports of uh, adverse drug reactions and how to respond. Uh, this is a very good and essential component of PSM. And for those countries that are receiving global fund grant, it's compulsory, it's a compulsory requirement that we have a pharmacovigilance program in place before you get the funding from, from the global fund. So uh, we have a session of uh, questions and answer. And uh, what does this, P this mean for PSM? We need to ask ourselves those questions. You are a PSM representative on a national drug and therapeutic committee. Uh, and three, advanced DR reports have been received on the same medicine in the last month. Three reports have been received on the same medicine in the last month. But as usual, we have vague information. It doesn't even include the batch and the lot number, but report patients as having nausea and vomiting and bad smell when the, when the bot, medicine bottle of tablets is opened. What we know for sure, there's clearly a problem. But how is this to do with PSM? And what as PSM should do about it? Very important, okay? In the table shows that report, screenshot and uh, uh, used. Uh, then what should PSM do? That's the most important thing. We have to recognize that these reports are never complete. They don't provide the detailed information that we require. And the general practice that clinicians always feel they have, they never have time. And anyway, it's your job to investigate. They assume that as, as PSM, it's your job to investigate. So they don't bother in filling those details that we require. What do we do? Do we wait? No, we do not need to wait. By the time the complete reports are received, inve investigations are made, made, patient welfare, perhaps even life may have been risked. Okay, by waiting, we can risk life. So, but we still emphasize we know what we're going to need more information. 
but we have to act now. So we need to take some actions in conjunction with the, the, the Drug and Therapeutic Committee, and we have to take it now. What do we do? We need to conduct a retrospective assessment of the reporting of adverse drug reaction, okay? And looking at this graph, this, this was done in Malaysia, and it shows the deficiencies in information that has been captured in the adverse reaction report. Okay, so you can see, I'll focus on suspected drug information that is lacking. Almost half of the report is missing. Okay, but still as a PSM, you have a role. If there's something you can do now, not later, now. Okay, so let's see what we can do. We have to acknowledge first. It can rise from a PSM issue around quality and iteration. Okay. In okay, in practice, there are some medicines which are more prone to problems than the other. We have to acknowledge that first. That fact is very important to acknowledge. So you determine if this is one of the quality assured category, high risk medicines, okay? We'll get to know that in the next slide. So, high-risk medicines with non-quality problems areas. So, as a PSM, we need to closely monitor this category of commodities using the following criteria. Medicines with a narrow therapeutic window index Medicines with inherent bioavailability problems. Most of you are taking the course. I think you know what bioavailability and therapeutic window index are. Okay. Products for new suppliers. Okay. And suppliers which had reported problems in the past. They had issues. In the past, we had had issues around the quality of the product that they supply. Then we need to take note of those commodities. And if it appears in one of those reports, then you need to take close look and consideration. Okay, so what does it mean? We need just to understand that there are certain categories of medicines that are more prone to quality issues than others. Okay, so, if a medicine is one of the following list, then more likely to have a problem. And that is purely a PSM issues. I think that's clear. This is an example of the, uh, commodities or medicines that have narrow thera therapeutic index. Okay. And uh, these are uh, example of medicines with bioequivalent issues. Uh, WHO has also published a list of pharmaceutical substances that are less stable and therefore require particular attention. So in your procurement plan, you need also to take into account this and prepare as PSM to ensure that we maintain the integrity of the medicines throughout the supply chain systems from receipt, QA, storage, distribution, up to the last user, okay? Okay, so you need to rule out if the medicine that has been reported is not from one of the high risk lists. If yes, then you have to consider that's a PSM, potential PSM issue and start immediately PSM investigation. Okay, in the process of doing the PSM investigation, it should not stop the clinical and other drug and therapeutic staff from continuing their own investigation. So investigation can go parallel. PSM investigation, DTC investigation. If no, then you should make a quick visual inspection. Okay? Preferably, preferably the same batch of medicine. So you will sample the same batch. If you get the batch information from the report, then you can go to nearby facility, inspect, have a visual inspection. 
Uh, the methodologies allowed to conduct visual uh, checklists are also include, included in the QS section, okay? And for those who are undertaking the, the, the postgraduate diploma certificate, I think we'll get a chance to have a look at that. Uh, if there's a visual inspection, then you have to speak with the DTC and withdraw the medicine pending further investigations, okay? You have already noted that there's a visual problem. So you don't waste time. You collaborate with the DTC to withdraw immediately. If not, then gather information and reevaluate when more data is available, okay? When a case has been reported for a facility, it's not widespread then, uh, and the information from visual infection is not enough, then you don't need to, you need to gather more information. You have to reevaluate and you get more data and you make decision based on that. So, this year, uh, visual inspection steps, uh, issues uh, that we should be considered whenever conducting uh, the visual inspections. And uh, this is a stepwise approach. Uh, we have the uh, very important part here to emphasize is the pack size, okay, which uh, uh, determines the, the, the exposure time that we should subject the, 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 the tablets that you're investigating. Uh, we see the $100 tablets, you need only five minutes. Uh, between 101 to 500 tablets, you need 10 minutes. 500 or more, you need 25 minutes. So it's very important to also have that standard uh, available and to be sure that uh, you are clear. Uh, uh, so for the duration indicated in the above chart, uh, that is free from drafts, the content of freshly open container should be orderized. So in exposure time here, we are looking for the, for the orderless, okay? So when it's orderless, then at least you are sure that the quality uh, is okay uh, with the preliminary, preliminary investigations, okay? Uh, then you can record as pass or failed in the physical examination form. And that information is also available in the inspector's handbooks, which you can download, you can find in the slides, and it's also available. Okay. Uh, decision two, how to obtain more information? You will need to send a person to collect information. Okay. And you send it to analysis. Analysis sometimes takes three months or more. But what you can do now is visual inspection. You also have the rapid test techniques you can use. Like in the picture, you can see, you should have those in place and be able to try them. You have to undertake a full paper investigation uh, as to the provenance of the medicine, procurement through storage and distribution, all the systems up to service delivery point, you have to see if the quality assurance uh, requirements were met, okay? So that's very important to also uh, adhere to. Uh, so these are some of the technologies that are used to uh, screen and detect substandard and falsified medicines. So that information is also available, can be of use in many of the, all the developing countries. Uh, they are normally short time, uh, maximum two minutes, three minutes, uh, to detect uh, the quality of these uh, medicines. Uh, so the overall guidance is uh, you have to take decision with full cooperation and in coordination. You cannot do it alone. You have to be coordinated. You have to cooperate with all the key stakeholders. Uh, the medical, uh, uh, the medical, I mean, in Tanzania, we call the TMDA, the Drugs Authority, Medical and Drugs Authority. You have to collaborate with them. Uh, okay. 
the drug and therapeutic committee should lead okay so the leadership with the, is the dtc but psm you have to be aware and be fully involved to take swift and decisive action so in conclusion the rational use of medicine are essential programs for all countries we cannot run away from that we cannot say this is for clinical part it's a psm also issue we have to be fully involved okay poor psm operations has the potential to increase rational use and we have seen that with vivid examples from other countries how it, they impacted okay it is the duty of psm medicines and health products to fully aware and be involved in rational use you have to be fully aware and be involved in rational use and pharmacovigilance activities. So our role is, is broader than some of us think and anticipate. We need to be fully involved and we have to be aware of the processes, okay? And we also know that the global fund, when you are receiving the global fund, is a requirement to have the rational use component in your plans to ensure that you receive the grant. Without that, there will be no grant. So it's very important also to take into consideration. So these are the key points on this module that rational medicine use impacts on PSM. And that cycle is also that the PSM also impacts on rational medical med medicine use. If PSM does not embrace rational medicine use, then PSM can never operate effectively and efficiently. We have to embrace it, okay? Otherwise, we'll be buying uses. We, we can't be buying quality drugs, but if we don't monitor through the system and ensure that we can detect where things went wrong throughout the supply chain steps and operations, then whatever we are doing is useless. So we also have to ensure that we embrace rational medicine use. It is almost impossible to prevent stock out without rational medicine. We demonstrated that when facilities resort to using what is available instead of what is desirable. So that's very important. Many PSM staff still do not recognize, we do not recognize the relevance of rational medicine use. We need to advocate. Our big role is advocacy. We don't decide on our own. We have the higher level, the ministry. We need to engage. We need to bring the evidence. We need to advocate. We need to show them the importance or recognize the rational medicine use, the cost inputs, all those factors. We need to take them into consideration. We also need to understand the operating rational medicine use program is cost effective. Okay? We can see the cost implications. Uh, PSM, we don't budget for PSM, but the impact of lack of budgeting is very huge. So we need to acknowledge and address the input of PSM in ensuring me rational medicine use. It saves money, saves a lot of money. PSM will rarely be in charge and be responsible possible to lead. We have to acknowledge that. We are not leaders, but we have to understand the rational medicine use and actively contribute. Okay? The RMU cannot succeed unless the system is active player. So that's very important, goes without saying. Uh, we have strategies in addressing RMU, they are already there, well established, and are not to work. They have been proven beyond reasonable doubt. They work, so we just need to advocate and apply them in our operation, in our PSM operations. We also have to understand the importance of pharmacovigilance in, as a component of rational medical, rational medicine use. So that marks the end of our presentation. Uh, this is a session for questions and answers. Unfortunately, we are a little bit late, but 
that uh, we can give a room. We also uh, allowed a participant to register their questions to the chat box. So uh, I want to welcome you uh, to raise any questions, clarifications, additions, or anything. Thank you. Yes, an addition is that we will share the presentations, like we said before. So don't worry about that. We'll share the presentations. Somebody speaking. I cannot hear you. I didn't have it on the chat box. Hey, your voice is breaking. Uh, we would request you to please drop down your question in the chat box. From my point, I cannot see this, any, any questions, but I want to I want to be assured that uh, the presentation was uh, clear to everyone. And uh, as such, uh, probably no further uh, questions or comments are available. But uh, I want to believe that uh, you all enjoyed uh, the presentation. Uh, somebody is asking whether you're getting the certificate. Prayer, please. Can you respond on that? Uh, unfortunately not. Uh, you may not get the certificate for the session's participation, but yes. Uh, we will be sharing the recording and the PPT of this session shortly on your email IDs. Thank you. I think that's clear. So without further, uh, uh, without further input, I think. Uh, 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 if you have any questions related to the topic, for today's session, please feel free to ask. You can simply unmute your mic or you can drop down your questions in the chat box. We are waiting for another five minutes, then we will be ending the session. So please go ahead. Floor is all yours. Any point of clarification, anything which was not clear, please feel free. Uh, if we don't have any question, uh, uh, Godfrey, I guess we must end this session now. It's already more than one one and a, uh, I mean one hour. So thank you so much for your participation and support and time. Really appreciate it. And what a wonderful slide and what a wonderful session by you. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Thank you all for joining. Thank you.